been a great morning so far and uh, very excited for our next uh, discussion with the uh, University of Missouri men's basketball coach, Conzo Martin. But what Conzo doesn't know is uh, we have a surprise in the, in the uh, crowd for him today that's going to uh, come here and she's going to introduce Conzo. That's our friend who took time out of her day to come in here just to introduce Conzo Martin. Here's what you might want to know about this person. She is a uh, three-time gold medal for the U.S. Olympics. She has one silver medal, two bronze medals. She was in four different Olympic games, also played basketball for UCLA. Sports Illustrated voted her the best female athlete ever. And here's the three words that I would say about Jackie joyner Kersey from what I know about her. She's generous, she's approachable, she's abundant. So please welcome Jackie joyner Kersey. Thank you, Conzo. You know, I don't usually uh, put my back to you, but I was trying to act like I wasn't here. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> Brett said that, oh, you're going to be a surprise for him. But anyway, uh, I, I, I just want to say I think you all are in for a treat, and you can read Conzo's uh, bio, but I just want to talk about the young man that I was able to mentor as he was coming up and growing up in East St. Louis and just seeing uh, Conzo with his friends and all the different things that they were doing in the community. And when I was at the height of my career, he asked me to come back and be a part of their basketball camp in East St. Louis uh, Senior High School. And at that time, we really didn't know what it felt like to play in the gymnasium without air in the summer. <laughs> we're trying to get young people uh, to focus and more importantly, I just want to talk about the perseverance of the man. Conzo played basketball in our, we had with junior high school, uh, Hughes Quinn. And that's when he first, unfortunately, uh, tore his knee trying to dunk a volleyball. And probably being stubborn, but you know, just like uh, young men do. But anyway, he went on and he continued on with that never give up attitude. And then uh, go on and go to uh, high school, do well, win a state championship, eventually go off to college, eventually get married, have uh, two young boys, but then also uh, college coaches and everyone looking at him, uh, trying to be their next leader or to bring them in the fold to be one of their college coaches. But then also touch, unfortunately, with cancer. But through it all, Conzo never gave up. Then going on to try to do, or not try, doing something that he extremely loved, coaching basketball, working with young men, trying to help them to see beyond the basketball court, helping them to become great individuals, and still dealing with racism, dealing with threats, dealing with all kind of different things that any person shouldn't have to endure. But he continued to persevere and eventually find his way back home, find his way back into the community, a community that I hope will continue to show love as he continued to coach at Mizzou. But then his heart of giving back is that the high school we went, we went to was on Bond Street, East St. Louis, Lincoln Senior High School. The school closed, but Conzo and a, yalli, a lot of the young men who grew up together found it, bonded together, finding ways to give back. And so with that perseverance, you know, Bob Lofton earlier was talking about what they look for in individuals, if they're going to hire them, talk about the honesty, you know, hard working and the intellect, but more importantly, the integrity. And that's what you have in Conzo Martin. And I'm very honored to stand here and introduce you. So give it up for the Conzo Martin, head men's basketball <laughs> coach at Mizzou.
Well, that's way better than I'd have done. Oh, thank you, Jackie. How you doing, Conzo? Not bad, not bad. Happy to be here. Jackie, thank you for being here. Obviously, you've got a lot of things you could be doing, but I know how much Conzo means to you, so thanks for being here. So we're going to do a little crowd check first, though, Conzo. We're going to see how many Mizzou fans we got in here today. Hey, my Z. We're going to do another thing, though. We're going to see how many Illini fans we got in here today. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that to him. I told you one time I'm a Mazzini fan now. You and Chris. Yeah. Where's Chris? Well, my, well, my good buddies from growing up back from, uh, from third grade on. I've got some friends here, but uh, that's, uh, that's how I got to know Conzo. It's from Chris Hollander, who's also one of the coaches at Mizzou. But, so let's talk about that night. I was a Mazzini fan. First time I ever went to the game, bragging rights game, and didn't root for the Illini. I rooted for Mizzou, and you guys won. Talk about that night. Well, it was a great night. I think when you're talking about that event, uh, the bragging rights game, it's a tremendous venue. Uh, a lot of fanfare. Uh, I think it's a great time of the year. Uh, and we had fun. We won the game. They're a very talented team. We won the game. But I think more importantly, what we have to try to do in this community is uh, make that an event a whole weekend because there's a, uh, we have to do a great job of helping the stores in the community, uh, getting people to go to restaurants, to be a part of that. And we have to do a better job, I think, as a community, of making that game bigger than what it, what it is, and outside of just the actual game, but just a whole three, four-day weekend. Yep. Absolutely. I agree with that. So um, I think a lot of people, I know there's no such thing as a typical day uh, in your life and you're crazy busy and you're traveling all over the place, especially right now. But if you can give us what's what's the lay of the land look like for Conzo Martin? What's that day like? Well, the last eight days outside of um, Saturday and Sunday. So the, there were eight straight days we had recruiting. So it was it was nonstop. There was a pit stop the Sunday before in and right back out on the road. Uh, and the last day of recruiting was uh, Thursday midnight. So Friday morning we had 6 a.m. practice. So 6 a.m. practice. Uh, then we had, uh, I forgot, there's so much stuff going on that day. My son came back from, from school. My son's a junior at Purdue, so he came, we picked him up. And yesterday we went to, well, Saturday we had a recruit on campus. And then we had um, uh, what they have a mile walk, uh, a diversity inclusion walk on campus. We did that. And uh, Saturday was relatively laid back. My wife and I caught up on Game of Thrones, a lot of that. So, <laughs> and then, yes. So then on Sunday, we went to see the Avengers. Uh, with my family. It, but for me, like this morning, I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. It just really, uh, it's, I, I feel like the earlier the better for me to get a peace of mind. And it's not always 4 o'clock. It's normally 5 o'clock just to really pray to have peace uh, uh, and just count my blessings. Uh, nothing major to it, but just to really appreciate everything I have because, I, as you know, uh, nothing is given to you. Uh, and at any moment, God can say, okay, I need you for another assignment. So just for me, just being appreciative of the opportunity, but the opportunity just to be here to speak because, again, you can have many people to do what I'm doing. I'm grateful to be here to do this. Yeah, well, we're grateful to have you. So is that when, when you wake up at 4 in the morning, you kind of walk us through that process. I think you know, I talked about it this morning about just thinking and slowing down so we could speed up. What's that look like? Well, it's, it's, again, it's normally during the season, it's at 4 o'clock because I can't sleep because my wheels are continuing to turn because of you know, what took place in the game, what's about to happen, making sure this young man gets better. But, but this time of year, it's probably uh, – you know, four or five o'clock in the morning, just really, I get my laptop, and, and the guy that, I, the two guys I listen to more than anything, uh, T, Bishop T.D. Jakes uh, from out of Dallas, Texas, is one of the best bishops I, I've, I've ever heard. And uh, Miles Monroe, uh, he, I think Miles passed away, uh, I think 2014. Uh, he's from Jamaica, uh, or the Bahamas, I'm not sure which one, I can't remember, but uh, another great minister, but his, his, his ministry is about more leadership-based uh, building, and then Bishop T.D. Jakes is all-encompassing. He just wrote a book called The Crushing, and I'll start reading that tonight. But So either one of those every morning, unless something that really catches my eye. So just, well, it's 30 minutes. It could be an hour and a half, and just really pouring into me, uh, giving me a peace of mind, uh, and just life to, to, to really try to be the best person I can become. Uh, so I've always, I've always tried to be a guy. If somebody give, uh, let me give more. And, but but you, I don't mean it to be weak. You don't have to be soft and giving. There's a level of humility, but there's also a strength and a toughness that goes with it. That doesn't, that doesn't mean to be weak. But I always try to give as much as I can give to people because that's what I thought my mom did 
with her life and mission. And when you have young kids, your life is cut short, so to speak, because you have to give, and it's no longer about you. And I saw it up close to my mom having four kids and how she gave and gave and never really complained. I, I didn't see her complaining. Maybe she did it with her sisters and her friends, but never complained, never made excuses, but just kept pushing forward and forward. So for me, the least I can do is show appreciation with my work ethic, being on time, doing the right things, having humility, and being grateful for everything that's been given to me. Yeah. What were the, uh, Joe Mark is somewhere in here in the audience back there, and he had a question, and we talked about, you know, what were some of the things that you had to overcome uh, growing up, maybe in East St. Louis, the difficult stuff that you may have had to deal with? What were the things that you had to overcome? Well, not to, not to shine light on what took place, I think, what, two days ago. Yeah. Uh, but that was it. And, and, and I, I, what I always try to do is I, I speak on that when it's asked. But I think oftentimes when, when people come from, rough backgrounds, they, they, uh, they like to flaunt it and like, it's a, like it's a good thing. Well, for me, I, I represent East St. Louis, that's who I am, that, that'll never change. But I always try to talk about the solution of it, uh, because that's not something you want to brag about. And when I was younger, that was things we talked about, like that was a cool thing, being a part of some of those tough situations. But that is everyday living. But when you're in that environment, it's a normal environment, because that's everyday. It's not a case, oh, that just happened, that, that's normal. So for me, growing up in it, my mom, she between, it was, if you're from East St. Louis, you ever been on that side of the river? It was a celebrity room, it was years ago. It was like a sports bar, my mom worked there. And she worked at the, I can't, it's the Mayfair Hotel for years. I, don't, I can't remember, Mayfair, Mayflower for years. And she was a maid there. So just, you know, back and forth for years. And no, so you, I saw the struggles and, and her struggling making ends meet. And again, you don't understand at the time when you're growing up, but you know what you didn't have. But I think the beauty about growing up in those environments, most kids probably had the same stuff. So, so it wasn't like you stood out in a negative way. Uh, and, and, and most people we grew up in that, those environments, dad probably didn't stay at home, but some dads were around. And I knew where I could find my dad. He was on, he was on this side of the river, St. Louis side. So I knew where I could find him. So it wasn't as if he was invisible. But, but I, I think you become callous to a lot of things because you don't have a lot. And then I started to notice I, I lacked a lot of things when I got to high school. Because, you know, in elementary school, everybody's from the same neighborhood. Junior high, everybody's from the same neighborhood. When you get to high school, you have everybody in the city from that high school. So you realize what you don't have. But I think for me, just, just by the grace of God, and, and I, was, I didn't pray back then I, like that. I mean, I prayed the normal prayer that my mom taught me growing up, but I didn't understand what I was praying. But I, but I think back then, just understanding, doing the right things, people had to really be praying for me. Because I, I didn't take gifts from, you know, street guys, drug dealers, even though a lot of these guys I grew up with, family members, uh, guys that looked out for me, but I didn't take things from them. So to this day, I don't owe anything. And, 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 and again, it had to be God, because normally in that environment, when you don't have anything, you take on whatever you can get. All right, so walk us through that, because I, I've heard stories from other folks that Maybe they did take things, and now, like you said, they owe stuff to people. And so what's that like? I mean, so you're out, you're shooting hoops, or you're playing baseball, doing whatever in the playground, and these guys are coming up to you and trying to give you things? And, and it, 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 it was all really, though they weren't biological family, it was all family. You're from the same neighborhood. Whatever you need, we'll take care of you. And again, it, it had to be God because I didn't take things. Uh, you know, like, like after a game, we played well. I got four or $500. I didn't take it. A guy, hey man, great job, hundreds of dollars. We had great high school teams. I mean, our state, state championship was very successful. Oh, a guy have a pair of sneakers, you know, Air Jordans come out. I never had a pair of Air Jordans, but I could have had multiple pair of Jordans because of these guys. I, I didn't do it. I mean, I saw guys with, with, with duffel bags full of money just in closets. I mean, this was, this was normal. Uh, I mean, and some of these guys are, you know, guys have reached kingpin status as, as drug kingspins. I mean, you're talking about moving all throughout the state and these are guys that I grew up with like family and just, but that was normal. Uh, th that's what it was at the time. Uh, they, they moved to Atlanta, California. I'm, I'm talking about guys that are heavyweights in that world, but some are dead, some in prison now, and some are blessed to be out. My brother's actually one of those guys that spent 10 years in prison. Uh, so again, you see it all, but you have to find a way to continue to push forward. And uh, that's not an easy thing to do when you, when you grow up and you don't, you don't have a lot uh, of clothing when you go to school, you know, just, and that's why I say you start to see more when you get to high school. Um, and, um, and that's where you have to really be strong. Yep. And what do you think it was about you that kept you from doing that? Oh, I just think it was God. I mean, there's no magic tricks to it. Uh, it just, I didn't understand at the time a lot of people were praying, uh, making sure. And again, you, with that being said, guys that are street guys and do that, 
they understand what you're trying to do. So they'll keep you away from that. So oftentimes when they would give me, it wasn't a case, okay, he'll be an NBA player, let's take care of him so he'll get us back. No, it was make sure you don't do these things. You stay out of the way. We, whatever you need, let somebody know we'll take care of this. But it was never a case of, uh, I expect you to make it, now you owe me some years later. Now, with that being said, these same guys, I look after these guys to this day. Uh, and I did it for years when I was in college. I, I'd send stuff home to these guys, not that they, because they never give me anything, but what happens, their compassion, because oftentimes we can judge wh what someone's lifestyle is, but until you're in the trenches, you don't know, you don't right. speak on it. So these same guys to this day, I look after these guys, whether, whether they're in prison, whatever it is, their families, because it's what you owe. Even though they didn't give me anything in life, you owe certain things. And I, I think those guys will forever be grateful for those small things. So being a uh, highly recruited college or high school basketball player, you uh, won two state titles. Alfonso I, I, I Ellis. Normally, I normally say three, though. Uh -oh. Because in East St. Louis, if you don't know, high schools, when I was coming out, started in, in the 10th grade. So they don't give us credit in the ninth grade because we were at the middle school. So technically, I was on the <laughs> high school team. So I got three of them. Just for clarity purposes, <laughs> yeah. it's keeping track. Uh, so what is it maybe you learned because uh, you got recruited probably by the Illinois and the Mizzou's, but you chose to go to Purdue, yes. be a Boilermaker with Gene Cady. Yes. What did you learn from that process? Well, the, the one thing I learned, uh, my mom didn't understand a lot about the game. Um, she, w whenever she could make it the game, she came to the game. It was just, you know, like, like most moms, I say this in a positive way, that's just my son, he's playing the game. As long as he's healthy, she doesn't know where, how many points, she just, I'm supporting my son. And, and for me, that was a great thing. Didn't know it at the time, but as a coach, that's a great thing because it was just mom. I'm, I'm not trying to be the coach. I'm not trying to do anything, just mom supporting. On our high school team, because I just came off, I, I had two pins in my knee. I fractured like Jackie was talking about in the ninth grade. I fractured my knee, so going to high school. Now, now for me, East St. Louis Lincoln basketball was the NBA. I mean, if you're a kid growing up, that, that, that is it. Right. They just come off a state championship. I'm like, oh, man. I, you, you, don't, you don't know if you can make the team. There's so many good players. And I'm coming off a knee surgery, so I had a chance to be a starter as a freshman. And like Benny Lewis said, he's probably the hardest work I've ever had. And I didn't understand that minute. So I was just doing my job. I started as a freshman. We had Lafonso Ellis, who's a great player. I mean, he was the fourth pick in, the, I think, the 92 draft. He was a very talented player, one of the best guys I've ever been around as far as a basketball player and a person. So we won the state championship. He left. We won the state championship again. And I think what I learned in all of that, uh, from my high school coach, Benny Lewis, was the ability uh, to be quiet. And, and what I mean, he's a low-key guy. If you see him, he coaches, he has a cigar in his mouth, and he never smokes it. Uh, and, and we call him boss, and it, it, it's in practice everywhere, but he never smokes it. And I can't remember if he had it during, during the game. Now, he might have it in his pocket or something, but he never smoked it. But his job was he allowed you to be free and play the game. You know, Oftentimes when we see coaching and we say old school coaches, you, you thought guys that use curse words or swearing all the time. That wasn't his style. He was laid back. He put you on the floor. You know what to do. And he did a great job in doing it. So I learned that from him. Just play as hard as you can play. Be a part of a team. Share the basketball. And he didn't overcoach you, but he did a great job of teaching. But what he did most that helped me, and these lessons, I didn't understand going through it then, but understood as I got older. He narrowed uh, the scope down for me as far as choosing colleges. And I say this with all due respect, when you're talking about a 17, 18 year old, 19 year old kid choosing a college, that is a male or female, that's a hard thing to do because it sounds good in recruiting. Everything sounds good, that sounds good. But you don't know until you're in it and you really don't know until you hit adversity or what that relationship is with the coaching staff. You don't know that. But what my high school coach did, because of the experience of years, he felt like Illinois was the best place for me. So there was no questions asked. That's why I was going to Illinois. But what happened was, when Illinois got in some trouble, uh, 89, if you remember, was a call with Deion Thomas, and you know, a lot of stuff took place. So they were about to go on NCAA probation. They were talking about giving them the death penalty. So you're talking about three or four years of you know, ban NCAA tournament and all that. So I decided to open up my recruitment, and it came down to Purdue and Connecticut. And my high school coach understood that I need to be around coaches that were tough, but also give an opportunity. And I leaned on him to help me with that decision. I just kind of followed his lead, and it worked out for me. And it came down to Purdue because Purdue just happened to be close. And they're both Hall of Fame guys and Gene Cady and Jim Calhoun. But Purdue just happened to be closer, so it gives my mom at least a chance to see me play. Nice. A lot of thoughts there about Illinois then back in 89. But we'll, that's for a whole other day. Um, 
So now we're going to fast forward, and, and obviously you got into you played uh, some professional basketball all over, played in the NBA, and then got into coaching. What, what was it about that? Obviously the love of the game, but uh, what you do—it's a grind, man. What you, I mean, I see your life, I see what you and Chris and all the others you guys do. It is a grind. So what was it about that for you that made you want to be a coach and at the highest level? Well, I, I don't think I ever wanted to be a coach. I think what happened was uh, Coach Katie, when we my junior year. He just felt like he said, I think he probably knew the fact that I couldn't play. Uh, if I had a chance to play in the NBA, it wouldn't be for a long time just because of my knees. And at that time, I had two major knee surgeries. And I had my third one going into my senior year. So our junior year, we were huddling. He just said, man, I think, I think coaching is your path. Um, and I think he, you probably heard it if you hadn't. He, he said I was the best leader he's ever had in his 50 years of coaching. Uh, and, he, and he still says that to this day. But I didn't understand it because, again, I'm just doing what I asked to do. And he just said, I think you'll be great at coaching. I never gave it a lot of thought. And, and I wasn't a guy that was praying every night to be an NBA player because I knew I, I couldn't last long on my knees. But the unfortunate thing, I didn't have a lot of direction. I, I couldn't see past five years down the road. The, only most, the most important thing for me was to make sure my mom has a better way of whatever that is. But that was, that was my only plan. I, I just couldn't see myself, let me see, going to an office. I couldn't see myself. I, I didn't see anything. It was just, I'm getting a degree because I'm supposed to get a degree, and my mom said you need to get a degree. But the only thing was, how can I make her happy? That, that was it. So when, when it got to it, because when I stepped on the college campus, they said he might be able to play a year at best because my knees were so bad. So obviously, we went past that, and I finished one of the top 10 players and scores in Purdue history. And then when it came down to a my senior's draft day and time to get drafted. And I just really prayed to God, just allow me see, to see my name being drafted. Not necessarily being the NBA yet and all that, just see, let me see my name being drafted. And it was funny, it's a funny story. Now this, this is true. I was, it was two rounds, 60 picks in, in the draft and the 56th pick, and, and as you, if you didn't hear my name is Conzo. So the 56th pick, he said, and the 56th pick, Constantine, I said, oh, man. <laughs> Constantine, I Constantine said, Constantine oh. Martin. And then, but I was drafted 57. So I was excited about it. But then as, as a competitor, I said, God, allow me to be a part of the NBA team just to play in the game. So I got drafted by Atlanta, was released by Atlanta in December, got picked up by Milwaukee and Vancouver the next year, or vice versa. So that was it for me, and I was okay with that. Yep. That was it because I understood it. You know, after having four knee surgeries, my days were numbered. And again, I didn't have a plan. I was just playing. I was playing professional basketball, so I was going to go until it was over. And luckily, I had a great wife, uh, and she was doing very well. Uh, she worked at Eli Lilly uh, downtown Indianapolis. And I just, again, it was just, I was kind of going. Not that I was lazy and careless, but I just, it wasn't a vision. And all of a sudden, a week before I was about to sign a contract to go back to Italy, Coach Katie called me. Well, I was about to leave. Coach Katie called me, who's my college coach, said, I have a job for you uh, to be on our staff, but it'll be next year. Which it worked out because I had to go back and finish up school. Because when I was in college, I never went to summer school. I always worked. I worked at, you know, at Kettle Hut Construction. I was making like 350 bucks every two weeks. I was working a real job just to send money home to my family. So I never went to summer school. So I had to basically go back and get you know, 20, 20, 23 hours, 22 hours to wow. get my degree. So I ended up getting my degree and then coach hired me on the staff the next year. So that's how I really got into coaching. But it wasn't a plan for me to be in coaching. So now let's fast forward and you uh, are back uh, close to home now at the University of Missouri, which is awesome. And, uh, but you know, we were just talking about it out there and somebody asked you what the team's gonna be like, which we'll talk about here at the end. But, you know, you've had some major blows the last two years. I mean, everybody in this room knows that, right? So I don't want to talk about the major blows and those people individually, but how do you, as the leader of this organization, deal with such news like that and then battle through it and get your team, the players and the coaches, to get through it? Oh, I really, uh, I just say, God, thank you for that assignment. And I really feel that way uh, because what happens is I think it, it might have been, as, as you, every year go by, time pass, you forget exactly. But it might have been about 10 years ago. And I just said, I prayed to God. I said, God, I'm, I'm, start, I'm tired of, uh, you know, when, when I used to pray for years, especially when you need things, and I, and I heard my mom pray, God, can you help us pay rent? Can you help us this? Can you, God? And it was always prayers of, you know, just trying to get over and, and, and to help me and to be strong. 
That's what I did. It might have been 10, 11 years ago. I said, God, I'm, try I'm tired of running, so I want to be the lion chasing. I ended up reading a book, The Lion Chaser, so I'm tired of running from, give me your toughest assignment. So whatever that assignment is, give me that assignment. But it, in all of that, I would just say, give me enough strength so when I fall to my knees, you give me enough to get back up. That's, that's, the, only, that's the only thing I ask. And then if it's will for me no longer to be on this earth, then I say, God, uh, you gave me that assignment. Uh, I assume that I carried it out accordingly. So if I didn't, then you'll take care of my family because he provided me with my family. And after that, I'm okay. But, but guys getting injured on the court, that is nothing. I've, I've had injuries. I mean, I, I, I look at a guy getting injured like, is it snowing outside? Is it raining? It's a normal day. That, that's part of it. I mean, because it's God's plan. I, so I, I've never consumed myself with stuff that I can't control because it's just a waste of time. Yeah. So if a young man gets injured, then that's his relationship with God, whatever he has to deal with. I was able to overcome four of them and, and still maintain, continue to fight so it can happen. But I don't waste time with time that, that, that I don't need to give my yeah. time to. Well, do you think it's fair, too? I think as fans, right, we get so caught up in the hype, right? Do you, do you guys maybe not get so caught up in the hype when a Michael Porter Jr. goes down three minutes into a game or whatever it may be? Does that not affect you guys as much as it affects the fans? Not for me because it does a job to do. Now, again, fans can be however they want to be because you're a fan. Now, I always say as long as you're a genuine fan. Right. So those are outside of that, I don't, I don't waste time with it. But... What happens is you feel for Michael Porter, and then this year you feel for Jonte Porter. Uh, but after that, I pray for him. God, it's your will. It's done. Move on now because you still have a team that you have to work. Not that you say, okay, you guys are off the team, but you, you have to focus on the task at hand. At home as a father, uh, when, when I was diagnosed with cancer at 26 years old, my wife was 24, I'll never forget when that doctor said, I don't know if you're going to die, but this is life-threatening. And I looked at my wife, glanced at her real quick, and I looked away because I didn't want to make eye contact with her. Well, if I'm down, then who take care of the household? My wife. We're a team. That's part of it. We've got to keep pushing. Now, if she just sit there and say, I can't take, Josh is four months old at the time. So if she gives up, then we fall as a family. We have to keep plugging, keep moving. So it's the same thing. I look at, you know, coaching. Uh, guy goes down. Next guy, let's keep moving. It's, it, because what happens is, we, we're coaching a basketball game, and it really, the big scheme of things, this is probably 10% of their whole life, this, this basketball, four years of college, that's in the big scheme of things. So now, what did you teach these guys as a, as a leader and as a man, as a father, as a coach? When they saw a guy go down, and they saw you crumble as well, coach, you gave up like the season was over. No, we keep plugging, we keep pushing. Because I tell them all the time, what, what, why would I get mad at a guy that, that that's goes down and you give up when you have a single parent mom with four kids struggling to make ends meet. She don't have sick days. I have to keep plugging. I got to get to work. I got to get them up in the morning. I got to make sure I get home so they can eat, make sure they're taken care of. And I go, up, go back, work late at night and keep plugging. And I do that until they're gone. So you're talking about 20, 30 plus years. And I'm concerned about a guy that doesn't want to work in this game, a guy that doesn't want to go to class. Why would I waste time with that? Hmm. I like that. Uh, oh, yeah. So I, I spoke this morning about the bounce back theory of, uh, of we get defeat and the, the most successful bounce back. And that's exactly what you're saying, right? So, but do you have that moment maybe where you don't let anybody else around and you go in the locker room and have some fun with a locker or something? And or, I mean, how do you let that anger out? Or is it literally just you're going to God immediately with that? How do you bounce back so fast? Oh, there, there, there are plenty of times I'm on my knees. That's what I question. Uh, but it's, it's not necessarily about the particular situation that was given, I always say to God, how do you want me to handle this? Now, what am I supposed to see in this situation? What, what, what are you trying to get me to understand? Because that's the, you can read all these books in the world, but if that's the ultimate teacher, then I need to go to the source. So I'll go right to the source. I need the information. So what I try to do is what do I need to understand in this situation? Uh, and just give me clarity, and then we'll go from there. But, hmm. but, but as long as I'm on this earth and I have a chance to control every situation, and that's how I look at it. I mean, yeah, I mean, as a competitor, you want to win every game. Uh, you, you'd like for all your guys to be successful. You'd like for guys to stay out of harm's way, to stay out of trouble. That's not life. Yep. So you have to find balance and understanding how can I make this young man's life a great life and, and how do I deal with my struggles but also manage and find time for my family that God gave me the family. And I always ask God that too, now give me balance. And you gave me this assignment. I'm grateful for the assignment, but you have to give me balance to understand that I have to make sure that my 21-year-old son 
17, my daughter, you understand that, okay, he's, he's, he's our dad and he's present. Because sometimes, you know, at the tough games, I can be in zombie state and it's just, I'm in the house, but I can't remember what, in those two hours, I couldn't even remember what happened. And all of a sudden, my daughter, she's going to bed for the night, and I was like, whoa, I lost that, I lost that day. And then after a while, it's 11, 15, 21, she's gone. Uh, so, so that's really my fight. Goes fast, doesn't it? So uh, let's talk about the importance of uh, physical preparation, but I would even argue the mental side is probably more important. So talk to how do you do that? So whether you're in a basketball court or a boardroom or an operating room uh, and somebody's listening out here today, what would you tell them? The biggest thing we talk about is mental toughness, mental toughness. Um, and we always say toughness first and foremost. I always try to live by a level of toughness, but I think more than ever it's the mental piece to be mentally strong, to be able to fight through tough times. And, and I think more than ever, a combination with the players that we recruit as well as the parents. Uh, and, and I'll give you a story. Uh, I, had, I had one of our kids, His because uh, what, what, in recruiting, I always try to be as honest as possible. I'm a, I'm a poor salesman because I try to tell the truth all the time. And then you know, telling the <laughs> truth don't sound as good. You know, just, but I try to tell the truth all the time. And in recruiting a young man, I was always saying, you gotta be mentally tough. You have to be tough because I knew what he was coming from and I knew what he was about to get into. Mentally tough. You got to be tough. You got to do. And oftentimes, when you're having success, you don't hear it. It just flies over your head. And I was said over and over again for you know a year and a half of recruiting a guy. He struggled as a player. He had success late in the season. Level of success where you know NBA teams like, oh man, this guy got a chance as a as a young guy, as a freshman. Uh, about my sister and I, we were driving about a week or so ago. His dad called me on the phone. Hey, how you doing? He said, um, he said, I just wanted to apologize to you. Uh, and I said, what, what's going on? He said, uh, I stopped coming to games because um, I was mad at you uh, because my son wasn't playing well and this and that. And, uh, but he said, I wanted to apologize because I was wrong. He said, I talked to my son. He said, no, it wasn't coach. It was me because I didn't this, 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 this. And he said, you always talked about toughness mental toughness, because I knew what was coming for him. I knew what was about to happen, because I've, I've seen it for a long time. So the mental toughness is very important to approach the game from the standpoint of being as cerebral as possible. And it's almost as if you're playing a game where nobody's in the gym. The great players, I mean, you, you, and I'm not saying anything wrong with gesture when you make a three-point shot and all that, but when you see guys that are locked in, it's as if nobody's watching the game, they're just playing by themselves. And that means you're keen on your assignment. Well, we, I, I take it a step further with our guys. When you talk about mental toughness, if a guy comes out of the locker room, never wore a headband, he has a headband on. A guy doesn't have wristbands, he wears wristbands. Arm sleeve, and you didn't have arm sleeve before the game. That means you're not locked in mentally. That means your focus has went other places. So let's regroup, take those shoes, I'll go put the other ones back on. <laughs> you know, take off it, the headband. Yeah, because it, you lost sight of the assignment. And I, I think it's just simple. Now, that's a hard thing to do with young guys. When you're 17, 18 years old, and I think the world they're living in now is a lot tougher than the one I came up in because of social media. And I think that what happens is they become stars before they even step on the court just because of the fans. And, and they anoint these guys at a level when they get to our program, they really struggle. And I think the worst thing about, and I, I know I'll jump off track here, no, now, no. Brett, but just, but what happens with young men and women, the worst thing that can happen to them is with social media, camera phones, and all that, they can't make mistakes anymore. When, when, I, when I was in high school, I mean, guys would beat me. I, I couldn't go out Lafonso Ellis, but there were no camera phones, so I was okay with getting better. They're afraid to get better now because their struggles, one str guy the slam dunks over you, and you don't want to try to block a shot anymore because that footage is all around the country. So I think what happens with most young men and women, they can't make mistakes anymore because we don't allow them to. So how, how, do you, how do you do that, though? I mean, so that's easier said than done because there are camera phones or all that stuff. But what are you finding? And I, and I think you told me a story one time, even as, uh, to go back to meditation, yeah. right? I mean, it's all about prepping your mind for success. So talk to us and tell our, our, our guest about well, that. Well, and again, I, I think that is very important. Like one of our guys, and a lot of people know him, Jeremiah Tillman, he does it, the headspace meditation. And it's, it's done tremendous uh, works with him, uh, give him a peace of mind. Uh, but it's also taken him into a spiritual realm where 
I sent him scripture and all that because it, it, at the end of the day, it gives him peace to be able to do battle because he's a guy that plays out there aggressive, uh, plays angry sometimes, and, and it's how the game's officiated on him. So he loses focus sometimes, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with the officiating too. But he's gotten better at that. So now when you see him, there's a bad call, he smiles because he's grown from that. And, and it's growth for everybody. So we, we spend a lot of time here space. And, and the other thing too is, we would never, when I was in school, we would never go see a, a, a psychologist. It's like, man, I'm not doing that. Right. It's weak. You know, you, yeah, you know, right. when somebody thinks something wrong, man, we, we, uh, I'm, with all due respect, somebody said, man, you crazy? Well, I'm not doing that. So they think <laughs> you're crazy. Well, our guys do it all the time. Sports psychology, and it really helps. Yeah. I mean, it, it really helps, but it, back then we wouldn't do that. Right. But it gives those guys balance. It gives them peace. It gives them somebody else to talk to. So I can say what I need to say, so I can move forward, and and, and I like it. I do. I, I use it time to time. So I think you have to you have to use everything possible to help these young guys. And I'm not saying do away with social media. That's their world. It's, it's it's my job to adjust to that world. And there's nothing wrong with it because times change, and you have to change with the times. But but I still understand who I am. Yep. So it's funny. I got to tell a quick personal story. So we have uh, we use Headspace. It's an app for those that uh, haven't seen what he's talking about. It's a meditation app. You can do, I think the first 10 are free, and then after that you pay 50 bucks a year and you get like unlimited um, meditations. Well, you can do it on Alexa. And so we will have some times before bed, you know, with four boys, it's a little crazy. And I'll be like, Alexa, you know, play Headspace. <laughs> you know, it's like, everybody needs to calm down. And my four year old will start being like, <sighs> he's like, he's starting to breathe before it even comes on because he knows it's like, all right, now it's time to chill, it's time to relax. So if you haven't used it and you've got a bunch of kids like I do, then uh, you might want to start using Headspace at home, like he's doing with the college kids. Um, how does Conzo Martin define success? Well, I think as a competitor first, you, you like to be the last team standing. That's whether you win an SEC championship or a national championship. And I, and I think we have the parts if we continue to stay healthy. Obviously, you got to get a little luck here and there down the road. I think we could do that. And, and, and the, the great thing about being at Mizzou has never been done before, to be a Final Four team. So I think that is impressive uh, to have an opportunity to fight for that. Um, but it's just, you know, you, you have to, uh, I, I've never been a guy that sets goals. I, I was able to do it when I was a player because I can control that. You know, when we were in school, we said we we're gonna win the Big Ten Championship. We won it because I was a part of that. What I try to do with our players, you guys set the goals, you tell me, because I'm not in the locker room. I don't feel what you feel. Hmm. I don't know that you don't really believe in this guy next to you. Now, I, you know, you, you can have team style, you talk team philosophy, it's what we're doing, but if you don't believe in this guy next to you, and I, I think you do. So I always tell our players, you set the goals of the team. But for me, I, I just think goal setting is, uh, when, I, when I got into this profession, I said, I, was, I think I was 27 when Coach Katie hired me, and I said, and I said to my wife, I said, when we get to 50 years old, we're done. Well, I'm 47 now, so <laughs> I got to keep plugging. Because right. my daughter, she won't let me quit. But, you know, I just, I, I think for me, uh, I, I said to my wife, this is the only thing. So I don't necessarily have a lot of goals because God's plan. But the goal is as a competitor to win a national championship. That's the, as a competitor. But I just say to my wife, the one goal I have is I have to move that date back. When she feel like it's over for me, it's over walk away. Because what happens, I think sometimes you can stay in this profession too long. You wear out your welcome. When it's over, it's over. And, and, and I'm not sure that you ever see me again. And I say that in a nice way just because it is exhausting doing what we do. And it takes a lot out of you because you pour into young men's lives. And you want them to be successful. Sometimes they don't get what you're trying to get. And I, and I, I don't, I hate when guys come back. And I know it's a reality 10, 15 years from now and say, man, coach, I thank you for the information. I should have listened. Well, I don't want that. I want, I want you to listen now. I'm giving it right. to you now. You know, because those stories, when it's oftentimes 10, 15 years later, those aren't good stories. Uh, so for me, it's just like when I, when I say to my wife, when it's over, it's over. And we, we did what we need to do. Hopefully we poured into lives. And I want to be able to get away from it and let somebody else do what they need to do. But I don't necessarily have goals outside of winning the championship. That's it. The Mizzou fans in here, are they okay with that goal? All right. You said it here. Uh, so let's talk about how you stay a student in the game, right? We, I mean, I, I talked earlier about reading and doing different things, but how does Conzo Martin stay up on the latest and greatest in coaching and recruiting and, and being strong? Well, what we do is as a staff, uh, like all our staffs, pick, pick different programs. That can be football, soccer, volleyball, whatever it is, pick different programs. Uh, how can they help us from a leadership standpoint? How do you grow? 
I, I think what I've learned uh, is you can learn best from smaller levels, uh, like Division II NAI programs, because they don't have the resources. They lack resources, so they have to be very innovative, creative, and have to really work at whatever it is they're doing because they don't have resources. I think oftentimes at our level we can get complacent, we can get lazy because you do have resources. So for me, just learning from uh, younger coaches because what happens is every year I get older and the kids 16, 17, 18 years old are the ones we're recruiting, so you have to understand that language. And not that I'll start talking like them, but just <laughs> you need to know what's going on in their world. You can't all of a sudden say, oh, man, the kids have changed. Man, they had to change this time. So I just understanding with younger coaches, what's the language, uh, the pulse. You know, I always say the pulse on the street. You got to have your ear to the street, you know. Just I'm from East St. Louis, so you always have to know what's going on. You have to be aware of what's going on, what young guys are doing. I mean, I, and I have kids, too, so I, I just want to have balance to know what's going on at all times, uh, but not to try to be young. I'm okay with who I am. Uh, but just, you know, we study other programs. There, there are five or six programs I'll go see. Like, like the one guy I really want to meet is John Chaney, used to coach at Temple. I really want to sit down and talk to him because, you know, he navigated through some muddy waters for years to get to a point where he was. And obviously, he's, I think Coach is 83 years old. So I'd like to go to Philadelphia just to sit down and talk with him just on the things that he went through in coaching and how he got to that point. Uh, so I, I always like to talk to guys like that. I'm, I'm, I'm big on how you got to that point. Not necessarily what, how you coach your team and all that, but just how you got to that point, how you sustain, how you how – you, how did you overcome tough times, uh, discrimination, all those things, and just okay. And then I learned from that, and I find beauty in learning those lessons. So if, uh, how do you find balance in your life right now? I mean, with the wife and three kids and traveling all over the place, what, what, what do you do to find that balance? Well, what my wife, what she started doing, uh, which is really smart, and she figured it out. She, she knows the calendar, the recruiting calendar, days I'm gone. So what <laughs> she'll do, she just call my administrative assistant and say, okay, you can block that. We going on vacation, so it's before I even get to it. It's already blocked. So, oh, I'm going on vacation tomorrow. Yeah, it's, right. it's already blocked. But, but right. it's it's the best thing because what happens? I know I'm gone. Right. There's no well. I got. Can you, you know, unplug it when you're gone? No. Uh, we went to Italy last year. It was the first time. I, I, Ninety percent of the time I did. <laughs> I really did. I just I shut it down. Uh, yeah, it, and it was probably the best vacation I had because I had a peace of mind and I, I, I think I was present. Yeah. Um, so what are your daily habits now that you can't live without? Obviously prayer. What else yeah, you got? Uh, I mean, I just, I think I live a simple life. Uh, I always ask for peace of mind. And just without my family, I'm, I'm good. As long as, as long as I have my family with me, I'm good. Now, again, they don't have to be sitting right in front of me. But as long as I, I have them with me and God give me the, the opportunity to continue. Because I, I like, what I do like, I like providing and helping people, not just my family. I like, uh, like well, she's probably not in this room, so, but you know, I, was, I was able to buy my mom a house. Mm -hmm. And now nobody can tell this story. It's actually in your neighborhood. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I've been peeking on you. So I know exactly <laughs> where you're at. <laughs> yeah. There's been this mystery man in our neighborhood, and nobody knows who the heck it was. That's you. Yeah, so. Man, you're pretty, you're pretty slick. <laughs> no. <laughs> now so, I know. We can, you, hey, we got some neighbors up here. We can report the news now. We'll keep an eye on her for you. Okay, you can keep an eye on her, but she doesn't know until this weekend, so I'll tell her this weekend. All right. So, uh, That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, but, but, but that's it. Just, just try to provide for people. And, and not, not that you, you do things to get credit for it or get rewarded for it. I mean, a lot of stuff we do behind the scenes, and we just keep moving uh, because I, I, I want to get my praise from God. And as and, and long as I'm doing right by him, then I'm winning the game. Well, there's one thing I think is clear so far today is we can tell what this guy stands for, can't we? I mean, it's amazing. So, pretty awesome. I'm with you, Jaggy. I know we're running short on time here, but I want to talk about, uh, for the parents in the room, what's your philosophy for sports today? Because obviously you're a basketball guy, um, but where, where are we as parents uh, screwing, screwing kids up from an athletic standpoint with this one sport, Play it all year long. I have a, I, we can talk for hours about this, but what's your philosophy? Well, I, I should have said this before. Uh, oftentimes when I, when I talk about something, you ask me a question, I always try to give context. And, and sometimes I, I jump off track when you ask the question. So I should have said it before we started. But to answer that, uh, 
if I don't answer clearly, <laughs> ask me again. But with, with my children, my wife and I, we've always said you play two sports, doesn't matter what it is, just play two sports, just healthy, camaraderie, being a part of a team, whatever. Doesn't matter with great player, role player, that, that wasn't the issue, just play two sports. And uh, so what I always said to our children, especially when they got old and they're in it, and they're in it I just said, whatever relationship you have with coaches between you and coach, whether the coach is the coach that swears and have it, whatever their style is, that's fine. It's life because it's, there's value in whatever that lesson is, good yeah. or bad. My only criteria with, with my kids, the only thing I said, as long as they don't put their hands on me, that's it. As, 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 as long as they don't do that, however they coach you, they coach you. Because what happens, even if the coach uh, verbally mistreats you, let's talk about it, what did you learn from it? So now you know what not to do. But as long as they don't put your hands on, that's the only criteria. But I think, I think with parents, uh, it's very hard. And I'm not sure in all other sports. I don't know how they operate. But in basketball, everybody wants their child to be a pro, an NBA player. And I think more so because of the money. Everybody want to be a pro. So now what happens is when I came out of high school, mom, my high school coaches, just kind of, okay, here's the situation. Now there's probably five or six, seven people dealing with one prospect and making a decision because there's money involved, whether that prospect is an NBA player or not. So now you have a situation, you're going through so many different people. Uh, the mom, and, and in most cases, the guys who recruit the moms there, she's the last one to know, that knows what's going on. All of a sudden, her son get in a situation. She really ha didn't have a lot of say with it, went along with it, it didn't work out. And oftentimes, you know, some people recruit from a negative standpoint where there's money under the table, mom never knew about it. So there's a lot of things that go along. So I, I, I think with parents, to really get involved with your kid, but take a step back, to get involved, to understand. And the worst thing you can do is, is, is if your child knows that you're talking to the coach, that's not a good thing. That's, that's not a good thing. If you have a situation, a real situation with the coach, then everybody should sit down together and be respectful to whatever's said in the room figure out the best case scenario for the kid. That's the most, if that's the most important thing. Let's, so let's figure out what's best for the kid. Some parents, they don't like the style of how a coach coach, but he's very successful. But it's still valuing that lesson. Whether he's mistreating you, you know, swearing at you, but you're successful, you're getting better. I'd rather have adverse situations when my child's in high school under my brother than when they're gone. Because now I can't, I can't touch that situation. Now I can't give those lessons because they're gone. And now the pain in that lesson, I probably can't get it back because I should have been able to handle it. I, I, I ran from that situation from the time they were 11 years old to high school. I ran from it, pull them out of this program, put them up, pull them out of this school, this coach, this, and all of a sudden they get to college, they fall by the wayside. And you're sitting there saying, it's the college coach. No, it's not the college coach. You just didn't look in the mirror those 11 years that you were hmm. raising that child. That's very good feedback. So uh, talk about the fears. Maybe the fears you've put in your mind how many of those fears blew up to the magnitude you put them in your mind to be? Uh, uh, I'll answer that next time. <laughs> what I always try to do is, again, I try to be honest because it, you, you come here, you pay for a service, and you want it real, right? That's right. So for me, uh, I think that the, the biggest fear, and I don't know what level, uh, just being successful as a black coach, you know, when I'm coaching a game, I don't sit there and say, okay, I'm black, I'm coaching this game. I'm coaching to try to win a game. At our level, there's, there's 67, I think, BCS level jobs. There's only eight African-American coaches and probably 70% of the players are African-American on the floor. The stereotype for years back, another reason I'll talk to John Cheney amongst other people that, that have coached years back, whether with regards to the level of how did you navigate through those waters, when I say muddy waters, because as a stereotype as a black coach, you're not very smart. So now, how do you fight through that? And again, I know I'm an intelligent man, and because I only, nobody needs to tell me that but me. My mom told me that for years, so I know I'm intelligent. But you still you know, fight for that as a black coach uh, to be successful. Uh, and then there's a, you have to have a level of presence to you. So, so I don't know if fear is the word, but I think, I think it's kind of understood as black coaches, you want to be good. Like Nolan Richardson for years, he talked about it when he was a coach at Arkansas. His team pressed, run and jump, did all that, and he, and he had athletes. Rick Pitino did it at Kentucky. He was a great coach. They played the same style. Both won a championship, played the same style. But the black coach, he had great players. Well, Rick had great players too, but it was like Rick was a great mind. Hmm. So you, you deal with that all the time. And oftentimes, I think what happens 
even the guys on the sports cast that are doing the games, they've been so programmed since they were this young to think that way. So even when they're doing a game, you watch how many times somebody do a game and say, Conzo Martin is smart. I don't know how many guys that have coached three BCS level programs in the history of this game. Tennessee, Missouri, Cal Berkeley, in the history of the game, that have built programs from the ground up in the history of the game. In the last six years, we've produced nine NBA draft picks. Only four of the programs in America can say that, maybe three. You've never heard that until I told you that. So uh, for those Mizzou fans out there and for the Illini fans, what they're going to get in December, what, uh, what's, what are we looking like 2019, 2020? I think it'll be a great game for both teams. I think both teams. Again, but I, just I, Mizzou as a whole for the year, what are we thinking? If we're healthy, I think we're, we're as good as anybody in the league. Uh, I think we have as good as any guards in the league. Uh, it was obviously a tough loss to lose John Tay because, in my opinion, he's the best big in college basketball. And I say big because he was tall but he was so skilled, and the stuff he was doing in workouts, it was just unfortunate. So there was no doubt in my mind he'd been a top five pick. Uh, so when you lose that caliber player, that's tough. Then, then Mark Smith, who transferred from Illinois, was shooting 49%, second in the country at three point. Yep. Second in the country, and he ended up having a foot injury. So I think bar an injury, we're as good as any team in our league. So you just tell me next question if you don't want to answer this. You may not want next to. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead and ask. Go ahead. You want me to ask it? He's like, yeah. So when you get the phone call, who, who, who makes the phone call to Conzo Martin when Mark Smith says, hey, I'm, I want to leave Illinois and come to Missouri? Next question? No, no, it's, it's a good question. I think what happens in recruiting, um, I think Mark was, Mark Smith, the kid, was just focused on you know, finishing school that probably didn't understand what was going on. Just, it's a tough deal to, to miss the basketball and school you dream of going to and it didn't work out. So it's tough to, tough to deal with and now the criticism of a fan base that once loved you, criticizing you for leaving. Um, so it wasn't Mark. So once we found out, okay, he was opening up his recruitment, I had already recruited him before. When I came from Cal Burton, that was probably late, but it was a relationship. Uh, so then when it opened up, it was an opportunity for you. Uh, and it just and he looked at other schools and, and it just worked out. Yeah. So do you guys talk in the locker room before that game, the Bragg and Rice game? Because, I mean, y'all, we knew, right? When he touches the ball, yeah. you know oh, what's yeah. going to happen. Well, the thing with, with Mark, anytime he touched the ball, he's going to shoot it anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, he was going to do that anyway. But no, I, because I don't want to put more pressure than what it already is. Yeah. Now, if I need to say something, one of our assistant coaches will go around about way where it might have came from me. But sure. Because, you know, when coach said, then that's what it is. So, but no, not really. Uh, and, I, and I thought he... It was one of his better games. He didn't score a lot, but I thought it was one of his better games as far as his whole floor game. And again, he, he basically did the scouting report because he was a part of the program. So he did a tremendous job with that, but I thought he played a great game. With, I, I knew it would be hard for him. Uh, and, and to get the win for him, I thought it was great, but I knew, I knew it would be a hard game for him. So what are your passions now? What do you wish you had more time to do? Uh, I, you know, I, I like now. We played it, but I like playing golf. Not, not that it's I'm a good great at golfer, it. too. Not, 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 come on now. <laughs> I'm trying to get better at it. I like being out there. I, that's the part about golf I like the most. I like being out there. I, I think that part is fun. Uh, but just passion, man, I, relaxing. I think because it, it's such a grind in what we do, whenever you get a chance to relax. And, and I, I like to see my family smile. I like that part. Whatever that is, I like to see that part. But I, I, you know, the mainest level for me is real low. I mean, I, I just, because I've, I've seen too much hustle and bustle in my day. Just as long as I got a peace of mind, I'm okay. I like it. Questions from the audience. Anybody uh, want to ask a question out there to Coach Martin? Got one question. I thought we were going to have, hey, there's one right back there. Hey, Coach. Uh, just a quick question on uh, the. NCAA and the thought of paying players going forward. Uh, I'd like to get your insight as far as uh, do you think that's something that's going to happen down the road? Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? Oh, that's a good question. NCAA paying players. I, I think um, what, what I think is what the NCAA should do 
for every student athlete, and it all depends on the level of revenue in each sport. Because we, the, the two revenue sports are football and men's basketball. But, but I think when you're a student athlete, that means the women's sports should get paid too, because they, they're athletes as well. So I think across the board now. So that means if you're paying all your athletes, then financially you'll struggle as a university. And that your athletic department will crumble. What I think they should do, uh, so I, I don't necessarily think you should pay athletes while they're in school. I think if you get a degree, then the university should give each student athlete, depending on the number, between 50, when they graduate, $50,000 to $100,000, either one, pay three years of medical expenses from the time, if you had a medical injury, so it's documented you had a knee surgery, we'll take care of that if you have any issues for three years out. I think the other thing is within a 100 to 50 mile, 100 mile radius, your job as a university is to call, if that kid wants to work, or a young man or young lady wants to work and get a job, you have to call and get that job for that student athlete. Because if you ask me for four years to work on my game, spend the summers working on my game, I don't have a lot of time to intern, so the competition already has a leg up. So your job as a university, we put all that work in for this university, we represent it the right way. The least you can do is make a call and get me that job. Within a 100 mile radius, we should have enough alums to get a job. So then, but if it's whatever St. Louis, the distance of Columbia, then it should be St. Louis should be okay, or Kansas City, that, that should be fine. But they shouldn't have to uh, interview for a job. The job should be done. And I think those are the things you look at. And now they got a degree, that's the trade off. And if a prospect is as talented enough to go in the draft early, then they financially said anyway. But I, I don't think you should pay them while they're in school because if you say paying them, then who deals with the taxes years down the road? That's another issue you're dealing with. Uh, when you have a player that disappoints you or doesn't uh, reach your standards, how do you deal with letting them know that, you, that they let you down without uh, ruining or affecting that relationship? Well, I, I think what we do is also like parenting. Uh, if they make mistakes, uh, I'll talk with them. And oftentimes, it, my assistant coach probably got to the guy before I got to him. We'll, we'll talk about the situation. Um, and, and if you have, uh, like I, I had a situation. Well, again, we'll talk through it. Let's work it out. Whatever the punishment is, we'll deal with it. If we need to call the parents, if it's at that level, we'll deal with it. But I, I don't kick a guy off the team over stuff like that. Um, and and I, I interview for a job. Uh, one, my first Missouri State, and they asked the question about if a young man got into a situation, how would you handle it? Uh, and every situation is different. I'll just say the first thing I'll do is I'll talk to the administration. If it's at that level, and how should we deal with it? Because I'm not big on just kicking guys off the team, especially when some guys I know where they come from. So you kick them off the team, and they go back to that. And now they don't have a chance to be successful. And then you look up, you read some of the paper, they lost their lives, something happened. You were a part of that. If you can talk through it, let's try to talk through it and get better. Uh, but every situation for me is different. And we had a young man, I was at a university, I don't want to speak on the name, he failed drug tests and he was supposed to get suspended for two games. And we suspended, I, I suspended him for the last 11 games. Um, and really just to try to save, and he was a good player. He was a star, starting center just to save his life. And he's doing very well, he got his degree, he's doing very well right now. But that was the decision that, that I had to make based on what was best for him. Somebody over here had one. You talked about focus earlier. When I see some of these basketball players with the hair and the tattoos, where do you draw a line with that? Or do you have enough influence to tell them when they're going overboard and they're not? What about how they look and how they're playing sometimes? It's a little. Well, I think uh, a good question, and I'll go back to that, and my wife helped me understand that part. When I, when I played for Coach Katie, uh, and this was 92, 95, all he wanted was a mustache, no, no other face or hair. Um, unfortunately, I started losing my hair in college. I don't know how. <laughs> so, I, so I cut my hair off. Well, that was unique at the time, outside of Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley. Not a lot of guys wore their hair like that. So. And my wife helped me understand when I became a coach, because I was the same way, because again, you, that's where I come from. You know, your college coach said this, you want to look a certain way. So I started getting guys with, with, with beards on there, and I'm actually one of my graduate assistants, when I coached him at Missouri State, he had a, he had a beard. And I was like, man, I wasn't used to that. So I, I, I said, you know, cut your beard off, and he had his mustache. 
But then my wife helped me understand what, is, what does it have to do with this game? What does it have to do with him as a person? And then my wife also made a point is, what is the difference with, with a black guy's hair and look as opposed to a white guy? What's the difference with a white guy's hair? Blonde, is hair long? What's the difference? So how do you distinguish that? So what I try to do, I just stay away from that. As long as, what I always say, be consistent, whatever it is. Whatever your style is. So whatever I see the first day of practice, I like to see that throughout the season. But I, but I think, you know, the, the style is the style. And I, I don't try to take away from that because that's the world we're living in and, and I don't have no problem with it. I'm more concerned with the production on the floor and the character of the man. Any other final questions? Right here, two more. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Eastern Iowa, a Hawkeye fan. And, uh, <laughs> your team was so good at Purdue, you guys made me switch. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. Um, do you have any favorite memories from like Glenn Robinson or, or uh, that season? He was a great player, uh, Glenn Robinson. Uh, he was a tremendous. He's my, he's, Glenn Robinson was my college teammate. He was the first pick in the '94 draft. Uh, he was actually the first NBA player to ask for 100 million dollars, and, and at that time everybody laughed. And he ended up getting he signed 69 years, 69 million for eight nine years. But he was a very talented player. Uh, great teams. He's, I think he's still. He was the last guy to score 30 points a game in college. He, he was, he was a great scorer, tough, tough as nails from Gary, Indiana. Very talented. Yeah. Hi. You mentioned that you were a mental toughness quite a few times, and I was just wondering if you would offer some strategies that you use to continue to be mentally clear and tough. Now, are you asking me in sport? Because in sport, what we would do, I'll give you examples. Uh, well, one of, one of the things with mental toughness is being on time and having discipline. Now, what we do in sport, the, the mental toughness is, like, for example, we might have a drill, different drills. We might say, okay, run suicides. Uh, make sure you touch every line. Well, the discipline is the way to touch every line. And then we'll do different things. Okay, we got two minutes left in the game. This is what we're trying to do. So to focus on those tasks at hand, to get mentally stronger. Or we might draw something. Like, I'll draw something up. I'll draw it up say, this is what we're doing. And I'll leave it there and I'll walk away. And what happens is, with most players, they rely on you to do everything for them. I'll draw it up, walk away, and I'll say, let's go. The clock is ticking. So what happens is force them, the next time I draw it up, to lock in on the assignment at hand and carry out that assignment. But I think more mental toughness uh, in sport is just the discipline of doing everything right every time, the accountability of being on time. If the strength coach asks you to do something, put 135 pounds on it eight times, you do it 135 pounds eight times. That's the mental part. Because the physical will take care of itself if you have the mental. But the mental is not easy with most young guys. But we try to just put them in different situations, game situations, to force them to think and lean on each other. And wouldn't you say it's the consistency of doing that every day, not yes. like once a week? Yes. I mean, I had a young man text me this morning. Uh, he said he, somehow he's sick this morning. So I guess that means he don't want to go to class. And get up and go to class, be on time. And that's part of the mental preparation of doing that because if you're sick, then you, you don't always say, rather do you just, you sleep, you sleep for eight hours good and, and your eyes open, oh, I'm sick. It doesn't it just happen <laughs> like that. I mean, it just, <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't happen yeah, like that. All of a that. sudden, I'm sick. Yeah. yeah. It's and amazing on Monday mornings how that happens, too. Get up and go to class. Yeah. Council, the coaching profession is very much a close knit fraternity. Um, when you came to Missouri in 2017 from the heels of Gary Oldham's first season uh, as head football coach. Can you talk about your relationship with uh, Coach Oldham, you know, how you may have helped him uh, be an experienced uh, head coach uh, yourself with him being a first-time head coach? Well, he, he was one of the first guys I, I connected with when I got the job. Uh, and Coach Odom being the football coach, for yeah. those of you who may not know who that is. And, and the one thing about him is that I think he's a really nice guy. And obviously, he's done a great job with his team, but I think he's a really nice guy. And I, and I think that helps. And, and, I, and I, you see the way his guys respond to him. And, and when you're talking about 100 plus guys, and that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but we spend a lot of time when recruits on campus, he'll come over, I'll go over his house. I mean, however, just a genuine relationship and him just giving me the pulse of what Mizzou is because he also went to Mizzou and the people on the campus, uh, what it's about. If I need information on stuff that's behind the scenes, that hey, here's a guy you need to contact. This, so all, all that thing, all those things that you need to be successful, more important, I, I just think he's a good guy that I like hanging around him. And, 
and I don't know if I can say that for everybody, but I, but I enjoy being around them because we can we can talk when it's away from sports and my wives hang out together. But just just as understanding, and I, and, I, and I said it before, uh, it was impressive. I think his team they lost maybe six straight games, and then you reel off seven straight in the SEC. I'm not sure how many people understand how hard that is to do. You, when you're talking, you're not trying to motivate 10 guys. When you're trying to motivate 80 to 100 guys, and you already lost six straight games to reel off seven straight in the toughest football league next to the NFL, I mean, that, that is a hard thing to do. So how do you get your guys to understand that? What did you do to get the, and I told him he should write a book about that, because that's not an easy thing to do. He, he should be sitting instead of me, really. But we'll I'll have give his number, year. yeah. All right, any other final questions real quick? All right, one more, Mr. Baldus. Question, Kondo, you've been very just open about your faith this is a lot of your journey, you know, which is great and I appreciate it in the setting. So just talk for a minute, how do you deal with that with the media who wants to separate you know, the head coach of the State University and who you are as a man, and then with the players who maybe don't have that foundation? You might oh. have struck a core with him too. He's an Illini fan, so he may yeah. be switching. Oh yeah, he can switch, come on over. Uh, <laughs> You know, that, that's a great question. And when I was out at Cal Berkeley, when I took over the job, uh, that's when I noticed it. And yeah, I, I didn't think anything was wrong with it because, you know, Tennessee, uh, they call it Bible Belt, so everything was great. But when I got to Cal Berkeley, my first interview, a reporter asked me uh, that question that you just asked. And I, I, I was like, well, what's the big deal? And I got home to my wife, we talked about it, and then she helped me understand this is the reason why. Because now you're in California, and everything is so liberal, and it's just their thoughts, and it, there's so many different nationalities, so many different walks of life, so you gotta be careful. And you're on a, you know, Cal Berkeley's campus, they protesting every other day, just on anything. <laughs> I mean, just, so, uh, but I didn't stop. Uh, I didn't stop because that's who I am. Now, w with our players, I always respect our players' space. I always respect that. I mean, they do what they want to do. They know who I am. I don't impose anything on them. I, I respect their space as young men. Now, what happens is they oftentimes ask me. Now, we had you know, one of our better young players. He was struggling, 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 struggling. Now he asked me for scripture, you know, how to pray, coach. Give me so, but, but it's not me imposing anything on them. Because I, what I learned a long time ago, uh, and, and I, I guess about six or seven years ago, we had a you know, pastor with one of our teams. He said, uh, he said what he learned, I'd rather be a sermon than hear a sermon. You know, meaning I'd rather see one than hear one. Because oftentimes, we can talk all day long, but your, act, your everyday actions, that's what really speaks. And that's how I try to live anyway. So I think our guys, I like to think they respect how I move as a man, a father, and a husband. Uh, they might not agree with everything I do as a coach, but that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. But, <laughs> but I think you, you, you have to be who you are. Because I think if, in a true sense, if you hide that from the people, then you hide it from God. So then you're really losing in the end. If you believe, now if you don't believe me, do what you want to do, but if you truly believe in him, then you'll stand on it. Ladies and gentlemen, Conzo Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Great job.